Podic. So first thing can start sharing. Okay, welcome back. We were discussing parallelization, the concept of parallelization, and uh, uh, how the big supercomputers in the world uh, have parallelization of the order of million cores right now. So in order to use uh, this large number of cores, we need to uh, know how to write efficient parallel codes. Um, and uh, we also discussed very briefly the concept of uh, mega flops or teraflops of flops in general per second. Flops per second means a uh, number of floating point comparisons for a single precision, single precision, not double precision. So single precision, how many single precision calculations can you do per second, for example? So uh, theoretically, it's very easy just to calculate. Basically, you, if you have your uh, speed of your uh, of your uh, processor or the frequency, 2.4 gigahertz, for example, on my computer, uh, then I need to know that uh, there are for, there are how many cores I have. For example, I have eight cores. Uh, then I just multiply this uh, speed, 2.4 gigahertz. Professor? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you uh, writing on your iPad? Yes. Okay. I Can don't you see, see your screen. You don't no. see the screen. I am sharing. Do uh, the, the, Does any of you see my screen? Do you see my screen? Uh, we can see your PowerPoint. We can see your PowerPoint, but not the iPad. You don't see the iPad? Yeah. Oh, that's bizarre. Just a second. Why parallelization? Do you see this thing here that I'm drawing now? Yes. You see? Yes. OK. So that's what I'm discussing. Why parallelization? This thing. So I'm, I'm drawing here with the green color. Do you see this green color here? I'm removing green color. See that? You see yes. That? Okay. So that's fine. That's what I'm discussing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So I tried to explain that I have uh, I have eight cores here with green color. Okay. Uh, and I have 2.4 gigahertz. So uh, let me take this PowerPoint. This thing. Eight cores. 2.4 gigahertz. Isn't that? And uh, it turns out that's something that I need to know that my processor is such, but more, more, most processors are such that they have eight single precision uh, operations per tick, per tick, not per second, per tick. So therefore I, I multiply eight by 2.4 by eight, and this is 38.4 uh, gigaflops per second. Now this is in terms of teraflops is uh, three 10 to the minus two teraflops. And I can then compare this with uh, with the speed of a typical supercomputer. And you can see that there are roughly 10 to the power of six difference, but that of course is completely accounted for by the number of cores. So um, supercomputers have a million, millions of cores, but each core is roughly of the same speed as my own computer. That's not, not surprising. Okay, but this is of course theoretical performance. The actual performance tend to be somewhat smaller but not by a large factor, but it can be a factor of two maybe, because in, to get actual speed, we need to run something which is called Limpac benchmark, which basically is running a linear algebra prob uh, problem on the, on, on the computer. Uh, now, it, if we plot a uh, number of cores uh, of processor versus uh, rank, uh, which versus the house, how uh, versus then, uh, rank of each computer. So this is the fastest computer. The first one is the fastest computer, then is the second fastest computer and so on. Uh, we will see that uh, that basically this uh, basically has a, a universal curve, which means that the speed of processors doesn't worry that much. I mean, it worries a little bit, but not that much. Okay. What, what worries a lot is, of course, how many uh, cores or how many, how, how many processors uh, computers have so big uh, fast computers just need to have millions of cores that's that's the message and uh, that means that in order to compete with the uh, computation uh, computational 
science around the world, we need to be able to use these resources, these millions of cores. And there are basically two concepts of parallelization or the, the two prevailing concepts. One is OpenMP that we're gonna discuss and the other, is, the other one is MPI. And my, um, my uh, personal um, preference is that uh, MPI is actually relatively easy to learn um, and I'm not gonna teach it here. Um, OpenMP is a little bit more useful for, every, for everybody while MPI is a little bit more specialized. So I'm, going, I'm not gonna teach it, but if you, if you need it, I think it's relatively easy to learn. But um, you know, first let me uh, discuss a little bit um, this concept of parallelization and what do you need to do? What do you need to be aware of when you write parallel code? So um, basically processor speed used to increase very fast. Uh, well, from 1980 to 1987, it was increasing, of course, exponentially, but with a with certain slope, which is roughly 1.25 uh, per year. So that's the, the coefficient with which it was, it was, it was increasing. And between 1985 to 2000, it was roughly increasing with a speed of 1.52 per year. Okay, but as you can see, there is complete plateau in here from year 2005, roughly 2007, maybe uh, to 2010. And, beyond that there is not much change in terms of speed of the clock clock ticks it's roughly two to three gigahertz that's it isn't it so we are basically saturated uh do you know why is that any idea the electron tunneling effect it's Yes, as far as I understand, there are two issues. One is quantum problem. The other one is thermal problem. I mean, there are both problems, but it seems okay. that they're, they're basically at the limit of quantum uh, quantum tunneling, yes? So uh, this, uh, the, 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 they were making smaller and smaller and smaller uh, 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 transistors, isn't that? And they became, they, be, they became so small that uh, there, are, there would be two large thermal effects and two large uh, quantum effects. So can't make it much smaller in practice. And therefore it can't be much faster. So lots of physicists were predicting uh, many, many years ago that Moore's law will break because, well, it was kind of easy to estimate that, uh, that um, a transistor cannot be smaller than something because when it becomes too small, we, we know that H bar starts to play the role. Um, now, however, of course, uh, Moore's law is not broken. I mean, you will see later on that uh, uh, that engineers uh, figure out how to uh, avoid the problem of uh, simple problem of physics uh, by just increasing number of cores. Uh, now, the other thing which which I am going to emphasize here is that memory. This is memory speed is also exponentially increasing with time, but with much smaller slope. So memory is not that fast. That's another concept that we're gonna to need to discuss. Okay, so Moore's law, as I mentioned before, it looks like that the speed of a single thread or a single uh, core is basically saturated or maybe turning down, but basically it doesn't change much. But the number of transistors in thousands on each, uh, uh, on each computer is still increasing. And that's because the number of cores is increasing. So that's the prevalent trend. Therefore, again, this calls for parallelization. So um, Moore's law is not really broken when you cor correctly uh, uh, translate it into the number of transistors rather than uh, speed of, the, of each transistor. Um, so what's also important is so-called memory latency which is improving very slowly with 1.07 a year. So this is the, this is actually memory latency. How much time does it need? Uh, how how much time do we need in order to access memory? So it improves a little bit, but it's very slow, which means that we need to be aware of how hard it is to uh, access memory when we do the calculation. Okay. Um, now, uh, OpenMP, we already discussed this several times. The idea of OpenMP is that you can access uh, all cores which are part of the same 
processor. So for example, my computer has eight cores. Most of computers uh, in supercomputer centers have 16, 32. Um, and almost every laptop now has at least four. So we, we should be, it should be relatively easy to access, um, to access all the cores and we should be able to um, execute at least part of the, of the code in parallel. And then maybe there is a part of the code which needs to be executed in serial. And then we, again, we can execute uh, the code in parallel. Now, of course, the, the code will be fast if this part, which is in, executed in serial, is as, as, sh um, as short as possible. So it should be should take very little time compared to the parallel part. That's kind of obvious. If the non-parallel part takes more than 50%, then there is very little that you can, can do with parallelization. Okay, so a few concepts. OpenMP is designed for multiprocessor, uh, no, multiprocessor core to run program on several cores using threads. So we are just doing this on several cores within one processor. OpenMP programs accomplish parallelism exclusively through use of threads. So uh, basically threads means can mean like a core, but actually thread is not physically attached to a core. You can have more threads than cores. Typically the number of threads match the number of machines of, or um, of cores, but not necessary. However, the actual use of the threads is up to the application. We will see this, that sometimes it's a good idea to have more threads than cores. Uh, OpenMP is shared memory programming model which means that most variables in OpenMP are visible to all threads by default. So in other words, if, the mem if, if there is nothing specifically said about the variable, then it means that all cores or all threads can simultaneously uh, have access to this variable. Um, but sometimes we need private variables uh, in order to, um, well, not mess up the algorithm. So the uh, different threads need to have certain um, variables which are um, which are um, different and that so therefore this is so-called race condition uh, because different cores would want to use this the variable with the same name at the same time so uh, in order to avoid this problem that uh, different cores would change the same variable we need to have variable which is private to the thread so that each each core uh, uh, changes its own copy of the variable rather than the same variable. Now, OpenMP is an explicit, explicit, not automatic programming model offering the programmer full control over polarization. So in other words, we will need to write a little bit of code in order to make this programming, this, uh, this uh, polarization happen. Um, now, polarization can be as simple as uh, taking a serial program and inserting some compiler directives. That's what we're going to do. But we can also do much more complex uh, things with OpenMP. Um, and uh, we will see at least uh, two examples. Professor? Yes. So are you saying that at some point we'll actually be able to assign specific, tax, uh, specific tasks to each independent core ourselves rather than letting the compiler take over and just split up the tasks? Well, in some sense, we are already. I mean, our the, the simplest thing was this Pragma OMP Parallel 4. Uh, we are already. It, it turns out that even here, in, we could add certain directives, which I don't remember by, by name, but we could we could say whether uh, this, uh, how exactly is this uh, split over course? So let me explain. So the, the simplest uh, directive, of course, is this Pragma OMP Parallel 4. Which, which basically says to the compiler that each that this loop, this loop for for loop, has to be split over different cores. Okay, and the way it's going to happen is that i is zero will go on core number one. I is one will go on core number two, and then score number three. Let's say let's say we have only three, so then i is three will go here. And then I is four will go here, I is five will go here, I is six will go here, and so on. So that's what's going to happen. That's what compiler does. If compiler sees this directive here, pragma before a for loop, it's going to split the first for loop here. Okay. In some sense, this is this is already um, explaining compiler exactly what it needs to do. It turns out there are some certain options where we could tweak this. So that instead of i zero, i is one, i is, i is uh, what? Why is i is two actually? 
sorry, two, three, four, five, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Instead of doing this, we could uh, we could take uh, I zero here, for example, but then here would be, I don't know, uh, uh, three, uh, and then here would be one. Yeah, we could we'll have this example where the first call would do zero, one, and two, let's say. Then the second call would do uh, three, four, and five. And next one would do uh, six, seven, and eight, for example. We could we could ask the compiler to do that by just adding here a little directive. I forgot what the, what the name of the directive is, but it's possible. Okay. So in some sense, we already have a full control of this. But we're gonna we're gonna learn a few other extra tricks which you can do in order to fine tune this polarization. Now, what's important to remember here is that um, what is what needs to be private in order for this code to actually work correctly. So, in other words, to avoid the race condition, the race condition means that a certain variable, for example, like variable x here, um, has to be different on each core. Okay, it's kind of obvious why it's different because uh, I is different on each core, so therefore X is different on each core. So it needs to be, we need to have a different copy for each core because I will be different. So by default, um, if the variable is declared inside the scope, inside this I loop uh, as local, then of course this variable is also local to a thread which means that we don't need to specify here explicitly uh, uh, um, uh, but private because it cannot be anything but private. You understand? So it's defined inside the loop, inside the scope, so it cannot be shared by different, uh, uh, different uh, cores which use different I. Okay? So in other words, if the variable is in the declared inside this loop, this for loop inside this loop here, then uh, it's definitely private. There's no other way that it can happen. However, variable which is declared outside, for example, this variable man D is declared outside somewhere on the top maybe, um, then it's by default uh, public, which means that all cores can access it and modify it. And indeed, that's what we want. So basically, when we do this, when we evaluate this thing, we want each core to write uh, the result into into a, into a, as an item inside this uh, array, isn't that? So each core will change part of the array. That's what we want. Okay. So uh, as we will see later on, the, the reason that each core has to modify the same variable is why the code is doesn't par doesn't parallelize so well. We will see that actually parallelization is in, increases the speed for factor of two to factor of three, but not a factor of eight, for example, as we would expect for the number of cores we have. And the reason for this is because this process here, writing into um, a common uh, a common array, is very expensive. Okay, that's not that's not easy. Okay. Um, and of course, if you, if you can avoid such a thing, it would be great. But in this case, we can't because we need to store the data somewhere. Um, yeah, we will discuss this later. So the loop over i is paralyzed. That's what this statement means. It's only the first loop that's paralyzed. If you want to make both loop parallel uh, with OpenMP i and j, then you need to create a common loop which loops over i and j at the same time. You could you could create a, a new variable which is called ij, for example, that will go between zero and to n x times n y, and then you will uh, calculate from this uh, i as being modulus of something and j being a remind, a reminder of this common uh, uh, common index, and with this you could parallelize both at the same time if this was an issue. But of course, in this case, we have eight cores and uh, Many, many thousands of NX, so this per, this common polarization is not necessary. But sometimes you, it's a good idea to parallelize several loops at the same time. Um, so note that the month array is shared across all cores. So I emphasize this is shared among all cores because all cores have access to the entire array. 
but each core is changing only its own slice of the array. Uh, X and Y must be different on each core as they, are as they are declared inside the loop. Compiler makes them private to each core. In more general case, the OMP parallel statement is this, which means that we, we have to define specifically what is shared, what is private. Um, and by default, everything is shared uh, and private is only things which are declared inside the scope. So in other words, by default, all variables declared outside the scope are shared, hence shared statement is not really needed. So I emphasize here declared outside the scope uh, because if they're declared inside the scope, then well, it's obvious they cannot be they cannot be shared. Doesn't it? Okay, so now I'm gonna write the same loop with for, with Fortran. Why? Because I want to emphasize this scope problem. So in in Fortran, we know that variables such as x and y cannot be declared. Um, inside the code. So the, you cannot declare X and Y um, in the middle of the, of the code. They always need to be, the, all variables in Fortran has to be, have to be declared on the top of the program okay, or on top of the subroutine. Therefore, all these X, Y and Z naught and so on, all these variables need to be private because they are declared outside of the scope. So therefore we need to write a statement here that X, Y, Z naught, and J, these are all private. If we didn't do that, the code would give you completely wrong result, okay? Now again, in C++, we didn't need to do that because all J, X, Y, and Z naught were declared inside the scope. So be careful once more. So here, we when we say int J is equal to zero, means that it's being declared inside the scope. And then we say double X, we declare it inside the scope. Double Y, again, we decide, we declare it inside the scope. And whenever it's decided inside the scope, it is by default private. So no need to specify it as private here. Now, um, yeah, in order to compile this code, we already discussed all you need to do is to add this F open MP directive. Uh, and then we change the environmental variable OMP num threads to a certain number, and that declare that gives us four uh, four threads or n threads to execute our code, and then we execute and see what 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 the scaling we get. Okay, and here is the plot from my computer. So uh, ideal uh, ideal speed would be, of course, one or number of cores up to I guess eight cores because I have eight cores. So ideally, I would expect that my speed is supposed to go like that down as one over course. And then basically uh, it would stop at, well, the speed would actually go constant from this on, isn't it? one eight, because I have eight cores. But what happens in practice, of course, as you see is, um, uh, is quite different. So, um, Maybe the first two cores seems to be more or less what ex what's expected, but then there seems to be some strange jumps. And then it seems that it saturates only once we have like twice as many threads as cores. Okay, so the speed is increasing up to roughly twice as many threads as cores, but it doesn't go, it doesn't go perfectly as one over n, but there is a quite large offset. So the speed that we get is not perfect. So the polarization is not so great. It's okay, but it's not so great. It's not um, close to theoretical uh, speed. So do you have any idea why? Well, what would you say? Why is this core, why is this polarization not as great as expected? There are some memory processing issue. Yes, yes. So as I was already, already mentioned before, the issue is that all cores need to write in the same variable, and that takes a lot of time. We will, we will discuss this later on, memory access issue. And because of that, unfortunately, this code isn't that fast, and it's theoretically not possible to make it much faster, unfortunately. Um, 
So uh, some uh, computations which don't need to, which, which need to do a lot of calculations and not um, saving the result of the calculation so often might be more parallel. Basically, it's easier to parallelize. So, but this 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 uh, project that's that's pretty much best you can do. Um, now uh, let's try another um, example. Um, yeah, th this example you can try yourself. This is just Mandel, isn't it? This is just Mandel that we that we have here. Mand Mand C. Um, oops. Mand the dot. Oops. Like this. Yeah. So if we do export OMP num threads is one, we get uh, the speed. Let me show you this. We get the speed which is. Um, which is roughly 1.4 seconds. Uh, if I do eight, I get speed, uh, which is 0.4 seconds. So it's only uh, uh, three times, uh, three times uh, faster, not eight times as I would expect. Okay, but if I inc increase this to 16, then I get kind of the best possible time, 0.228. Um, so, but I still don't get factor of eight as, as I would expect, isn't it? So I get only factor of uh, factor of uh, five. So factor of five rather than factor of eight. Although I have eight processors, I cannot make it more than factor of five faster. So it's reasonable, but not not perfect. And it, that happens only when I have sixteen threads, not eight threads. Although I have eight cores. So in some sense looks a bit strange. Uh, we'll see that in different cases, you can have different speed ups, quite substantially different. So another example I wanted to show you is so-called uh, pi uh, example of calculating pi with trapezoid rule. So um, if you integrate this, uh, uh, this integral 4 divided by 1 plus x squared, if you remember from your high school, this uh, gives you arc tangents. Uh, and uh, int it integrates to pi. Okay, so we we can uh, use the usual trapezoid rule uh, and get um, and get this uh, calculated in, in parallel. And the question is, uh, how much optimization can we get by doing this in parallel rather than uh, on a single core? Uh, so here is the code. The code is really simple. Uh, we uh, we have small dx, which is uh, the size of the interval, that it's one over n. N is number of uh, of um, uh, of this uh, uh, is one over n in size of the interval. So it means n is number of intervals uh, for trapezoid integration. Um, and uh, f sum is the final result that we wanna that we wanna get. Um, and uh, X is then position in uh, the uh, in the in the interval, uh, which is i plus one half times dx. Again, this is trapezoid rule. X is the running variable, and all we need to do is to, to evaluate function f. Function f is here, four divided by one plus x squared. We evaluate this function f uh, on this variable x. We sum up and then we multiply with dx with this with the with the size of the of the uh, of the interval. So clearly, the algorithm is completely straightforward. Uh, uh, the question is, how do we make this parallel? And of course, uh, we should just add pragma OMP parallel four in front of the i loop. So that means that we are parallelizing this i loop here. But the issue is that each core will need to add to this variable f sum, okay? And we want uh, all cores to contribute to f sum, of course. Every thread that it does the calculation needs to add to the same f sum. So this is slightly different problem that we saw before where, um, uh, where each core would write into a different variable or different part of the variable into a common array. Here we are not writing a common array, but we are kind of reducing it to the common variable f sum. Now for this case, we have a special 
uh, parallel four uh, uh, um, statement, which is called reduction. Okay, so it's a special OpenMP statement of reduction, and we need to explain which type of reduction it is, and then which variable will be assigned to this reduction. Okay, so in terms of operations that we can do with reduction is plus, we can also do minus, we can do times, we can do minimum, because you can imagine that we can, might also need to uh, search for minimum or maximum um, in, uh, in such a do loop, such a for loop. Then we can also do um, uh, this statement, which is called end. So this is logical end, logical or, logical x or, and this is uh, boolean uh, and and boolean or. Okay, these are all possible reductions that you that are supported within OpenMP, and then you need to specify which variable is the target of this reduction. Okay, so that's a relatively easy code. Um, yeah, so well, there's an alternative type of um, uh, type of parallelization. Uh, which, we, as we will see, makes the code way slower, okay? But it's very mm, generic. Let me explain. So there is, a, there is a statement which is called pragma OMP critical, okay? So what this pragma OMP critical means is that this, this next, next line, just following this pragma, is something that cannot be parallelized. Okay, so in other words, it, this statement cannot be executed in, um, independently by two different threads. Okay, every thread needs to execute this uh, in serial. That's what we're saying. So in other words, if there is this pragma OMP critical, it means this part of the code cannot be executed in parallel. Okay, fair. And now, of course, we, we don't need to specify any reduction. We just have typical pragma on p parallel for. So this code works as well, okay? There's no problem with this code, it executes, but in terms of speed, it's just disaster. We will see later on, we'll see soon why. But the point is that this, of course, because of that statement here, we need to wait, every core needs to wait on other cores to, to do its part, to, to sum this up. And what do you need to do in each core? Almost nothing. So basically, you just evaluate this function, which is very cheap. And then we need to wait for other cores to add to the variable. So of course, that polarization is pretty disastrous. Um, now, of course, if this evaluation of the function would be critical, would be very expensive, let's say that the function itself is extremely expensive function, then this polarization would not be so bad because there's a lot that different cores need to do before they come to this critical part. But uh, right now, because this relation of F is, 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 is simple, um, that statement, unfortunately, makes polarization really, um, um, really bad. Now, let me demonstrate that. So I have this pi example here, uh, which I coded. You can code it yourself if you want to. It's, it's really simple. Um, you can see the you you can see this um, uh, this state this uh, code now, isn't it? You can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, you see. Yes, okay. we can. You can. Yeah. Sometimes I don't know what's being shared. Um, so uh, so here we have we have this uh, cal uh, calculation of pi with this reduction statement, and this is calculation of pi in the bad way, which has this OMP critical statement. Okay. Apart from that, they're, they're identical codes. Um, now uh, let's see how. What about the speed? How is this? How how good is the speed? So I'm gonna again check the uh, clock time and uh, and the wall time, and I'm gonna repeat this. Uh, well, first I I don't need to repeat this at all, uh, but in order to um, estimate the speed better, it's a good idea to make to repeat this many times. So if I do this um, example, I see that uh, well, clock time and wall time is tiny, very, very small. So in the clock time is too small, uh, 
that's it's hard to time. There's a lot lot of error bar in timing. So I'm going to repeat this at least thousand times just to get a bit better measurement of time. So if I repeat this thousand times, I see that the clock time and the wall time are quite different. But now let me check uh, if I have one thread only, then uh, they are both 1.29, 1.29, whatever, one of those. I mean, they should be the same. So this is roughly the speed that you need on a single core, 1.29, let's say. Now, if I do eight, I should get uh, improvement in time. And indeed, I get huge improvement. So wall time is only this divided by previous time. I got, imp no, this should be the other way around. I got improvement of five, OK? So with eight cores, I got improvement of five, which is pretty decent. Of course, there's still some little time that, that needs to be spent in uh, this reduction. So it's not exactly eight, but it's pretty decent. Now, if I increase this to 16, which was best before, now we'll see that actually it does not improve. See, this time is now uh, 0.26, which is the same as before. So in other words, having more than eight cores, or more than eight threads, when you have eight cores, doesn't improve in this case. Okay, so in this case, the best the best case scenario is basically the same number of cores as the number of threads. Okay, um, and the speed up is pretty decent of the order of five on eight cores. However, um, what happens if we uh, parallelize this? with uh, pragma OMP critical. So pragma OMP critical is, uh, I'm gonna use this, the other, the other uh, uh, calculate pi bad, which uses pragma OMP critical, okay? And now we can go and take our coffee, okay? It's basically just the one, diff one, one line difference, but it takes forever. Okay, huge amount of time. So we are not going to finish this, not today. Um, now, if we do this on one thread, then it might not be so bad. It's still bad, but not that bad. Uh, still too much. So basically this OMP critical, even on one single thread, makes things extremely slow. 20 seconds, really bad. Now, uh, let me reduce this, this thousand to 100 because otherwise it's really not possible to even uh, time it. Okay, so now it should be two rather than 20, two seconds on one core. Uh, again, remember that, uh, uh, that before it was, uh, it was 100 times faster. So now I do on new threads eight, no, four, let's say four. And you will see that actually time is gonna increase rather than decrease. So we use more core, more cores, and the time goes from two to 21. No, actually wall time is what you need to look. So it, wall time goes from two to six. So it increases for factor of six by having four cores. And if I add to eight cores, it will increase further. So in other words, this is a case where more cores make, make the calculation slower and substantially slower, not faster. Even on one core is slow, but the more cores is even worse. So in other words, if the code is well written, it should, of course, multi-core multi -core calculation should be faster rather than slower. But if you use too much of those, uh, uh, of those um, serial parts, then it can even slow down the code. So it's a good idea to um, kind of uh, think your algorithm through and try to you avoid um, serial statements inside the parallel code, because that actually means that all course, all uh, course need to wait for this, uh, this critical part to be executed. So um, we're gonna come back to OpenMP 
uh, soon, but now we're going to discuss how this um, access to memory works and why uh, this OpenMP codes were not as fast as expected. So naively, we would say that if we have eight cores and eight threads, we should get speed up of factor of eight, but we didn't. And I want to explain why and basically how to improve your code to get maximum performance possible. Uh, is there any question up to here? I had one thing. Um, I noticed, and it's not the topic of the discussion, but as you were increasing the number of cores you had, your error was going up. Whoops. Ever so slightly. Uh, really? 5.5 uh, times to minus 14 to, yeah, it's still relatively small. Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know why the error goes up. Naively, I would say it shouldn't, but I mean, it has to do probably with, with precision somehow, precision of uh, calculation. There is the, the error is still relatively small, 10 to the minus 14, which is basically comes from floating point precision. Um, I wouldn't know uh, why this changes. Naively, I would say it shouldn't, but I guess sometimes the error does depend on the, uh, on the uh, order of the operations. So it seems that the order operation change and the error changes a little bit. Shouldn't be too big of a, of a change. If I didn't make a bug, if I didn't introduce a bug in the code. Um, okay. So what I want to present now is uh, something about architecture of the of typical computer and why this polarization is not as efficient as uh, we would expect. So mostly has to do with the, with access to the memory. So this is a sketch of the, of the computer sketch. Okay. So we're going to start very simple. So let's say we have only two cores. Of course, in, in reality, we have much more. Then there is some memory, which is usually called L1 cache and sometimes L2 cache, which is on the chip, which is very close to the core. Then there is some memory, which usually it's called L3 cache, which is off the chip, which is kind of shared between the different cores. And then finally, there is something that's called RAM or memory that is shared between all the cores. Now, what you need to understand here is that this connection, this line here, is very, very uh, uh, weak in the sense that uh, it's very expensive for a core to, to go through this weak line and access a single byte of memory, okay? And that's the reason why our codes are not as fast as you would expect. And we need to understand this. So memory access is slow when several cores need to manipulate few megabytes of data, several cores compete for the bandwidth and access to RAM and the L3 cache. Now, let me demonstrate this with some numbers. So let's say we have uh, our CPU, which has a speed of three gigahertz. Okay, speed of three gigahertz means that every uh, clock tick needs only 0.3 nanoseconds. Okay, that's the amount of time that a, a single clock tick needs. Now, since we, we can do eight floating point operations per tick, means that floating point operation takes only 0.04 nanoseconds. Okay, so this is the number for single single floating point operations, such as multiplication, summation, or any of that, okay? Now, compare this to the reading of a single number from memory. So if you have a number which is written in the first cache, which is called L1 cache, look at this cache here, the L1 cache is on chip. It turns out that the amount of time that you need just to access a single byte is one nanosecond, okay? one nanosecond to get a simple single byte from L1 cache compared to 0.04 for one floating point operation. You see that this is quite expensive. Now I need to explain, explain what latency is. Latency is delay incurred when a processor accesses data inside the memory, even when reading just one number. Okay, so latency means how much time do we need to wait before we kind of can access uh, the memory, even if we need a single byte, okay? 
Now in practice, of course, it turns out we usually take more than one byte, but still just to get a single byte, we need this time. Bandwidth is a different, it's a different story. It's a rate at which data can be read from the story stored, uh, stored into memory by a processor. So rate uh, bandwidth, of course, is important when you're, when you're, um, uh, when you are accessing a lot of data, because we need to know how much data per second can be can be manipulated or can be uh, copied. But latency is something that means for a single byte, how much would it take before I can get uh, such um, data. Now, latency in L1 cache, which is the closest, which is this one on the chip, is the closest, is one nanosecond while the size of the uh, of the cache is 16 kilobytes only then latency of the second cache l2 is called it's 3 nanoseconds and the size is 256 kilobytes now both l1 and l2 are here on the chip now l3 cache the latency is 6 nanoseconds and size is 2 megabytes so this is this one here which is kind of shared and you, you can understand six nanoseconds is actually a lot compared to a floating point operation of 0.04 nanoseconds. So better make a lot of floating point operations before you try to access memory because that's expensive. And then finally, uh, to access RAM, we need 20 nanoseconds. Uh, and of course the size is in gigabytes and then bandwidth or the uh, how much, uh, um, how, many, um, how much data can we pump per second is 0.3 gigahertz. This is still a factor of 10 slower than the clock tick. Okay. So the point is that memory, memory is slow and the access, the access to memory is slow and the reading of memory is slow. And this you can see if you plot this um, um, speed or basically latency or speed, how much does it take? in order to access certain amount of data. If your data uh, fits into L1 cache, which is around 16 kilobytes in this case, you see that the speed is basically uh, pretty flat, okay? But once you start accessing memory, which is outside this range, you see a jump, pretty substantial jump. Why? Because now we need to go to L2 cache. The computer cannot do calculation with L1 cache, it needs to go to L2, and we clearly see a jump in speed. And then if we have even more data, then we have a clear another jump into the L3 cache. And then eventually when the data is even bigger than that, we always need to access uh, a RAM. And then of course the, the, the latency is much bigger or the, the, the time is much bigger. So depending on how big a race you manipulate, it might take much more time in order to um, access the memory. Now, of course, you can, you can improve this curve substantially by not using the data randomly. What you need to do is to always use uh, memory in sequence, okay? And if you do that, then you can avoid this horrible curse of memory speed. So we will discuss this uh, soon. But the idea is that whenever you access memory, uh, the computer doesn't load a single uh, byte, but it use it 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 loads always always a page which is several bytes, and if you can use uh, intelligently this amount of data that is being loaded every time, you can improve this uh, performance substantially. But um, gonna gonna get this uh, there in a second. So first, um, a little bit more. Um, um, realistic uh, view of computer. So we typically have, uh, well, several cores, core zero, core one, core two, core two uh, and maybe, I don't know, core six in this case. Um, and each core has on the chip L1 and L2 cache. So we said L1 cache roughly 32 kilobytes, L2 cache 256 kilobytes. And then there is something which is called um, interconnect uh, that connects all these cores together. And on this interconnect is attached L3 cache, which is slightly bigger. Okay. So L3 cache is something that's being shared among all the cores on the processor. And then of course the memory is being shared of all the cores of the processor. That's how the memory is. This also goes through so-called interconnect. What's very important to understand now here is that all these connections here are slow. This is slow and therefore this latency occurs. Um, 
Yeah, since we write data into common variable, speed is limited by memory access and not computation. Hence, we don't get we don't get the theoretical performance. That's what we when we were discussing this previous program that we wrote, we did not get theoretical performance because we need to write things to memory. Uh, now the question is why do we get speed up when using more than uh, eight uh, threads? For example, in my computer, 16 threads were better than eight. And it turns out that this is because, again, because of access to memory, sometimes it's better to flood the uh, computer with, with more than uh, one thread because there is so much spare um, capacity on uh, on core to do the calculation that you can do two or three, you can serve two or three uh, th threads simultaneously um, to do the calculation. And only then you write something to memory uh, from this particular core. So yeah, this is this is one way to, to look at it. So let's say you have several threads. This C here is the calculation that they do. And M is the time that they need to, to write something to memory. And typically, this, uh, this thing is, is uh, staggered in the sense that when one um, core writes something to memory, the second one hopefully does the calculation. And then the third one hopefully does the calculation. So only one of them, uh, or two or three, they write to memory at the same time, but not all, because that would be that would be uh, that would not be possible. It would take too, too much time. So this uh, computer will try to stagger writing to memory uh, to uh, speed up the process. Um, now, how to improve the memory management? Then, now that we understood a little bit how this works, so what are the tricks to speed it up? Um, so, to squeeze out the best performance can be a very hard software engineering problem which is handled by the compiler and user does not have always a complete overview of how this is done. However, there are some general ideas or tips of how to access uh, memory to allow the compiler to optimize the code well. So first of course is do not use hard disk for non-dimensional data, keep data in RAM. If you need RAM, estimate whether it fits into RAM, rethink your algorithm before you start writing to disk. It's kind of obvious, you have to use RAM rather than disk. Um, and it's not necessary has to do anything to, with, with this memory that we discussed. However, these two other items are very important. So try avoiding random access of data in RAM to reduce cache misses. So in other words, don't use random access, okay? Random access means that I need uh, a data at one part of the five part of the array, and then in the next operation, I'm gonna use a data which is somewhere completely different, okay? That's bad. This is called random access, don't do that because I'm going to need to reload um, data every time I do some operation. So the data which you need in the innermost loop should be stored in a way that the access is maximally continuous. So the idea of continuously using memory is important because uh, whenever we load memory, uh, we load more than just a byte. So uh, the point is, why should we use, why should we access memory continuously? Because CPU does not load a single number, but a page, which is actually 64 bytes or basically eight doubles. Okay. So um, let me demonstrate this on a simple example. It's going to be completely clear in a second. So let's say that we have the, here CPU, then we have cache, and then this is a uh, RAM. And the user wants this particular byte of data. So what happens in the computer? Well, uh, first, our uh, computer will check what is the cache size. Let's say that this is the cache size. We said this is uh, eight doubles or 64 bytes. And then it will load the entire page into uh, cache. And then CPU will know, will, will know how to access cache. Okay, so that's what happens. Okay, load it into cache. So this particular data is now loaded into cache and CPU can access it. That's great. So now if next operation that you do needs data very close by this and this and this data, uh, we don't need to do anything uh, anymore because the data is already there, okay? So if we access memory sequentially, then we will be able to use all this data that was, that was being uh, loaded into memory. And that will reduce the speed, well, it will increase the speed or reduce the 
uh, so-called cache misses substantial. However, if you are accessing memory, memory randomly, so let's say that the user then wants to have another byte of data, which is somewhere quite far away from the previous, well, more than one, one page away from the previous data, then, well, there's a problem. The, compile, the, the computer now needs to figure out in which page that, that uh, memory is. So figure out the entire page and then load the entire page into cache. Okay, that's the next step. Now this page is in the cache. Um, well, and you can do you can do this several times, one, two, three, four, and well, then the entire cache is full. I mean, this is sketch, of course. I mean, we before I presented you exactly what is the size of each cache and what's the size of of memory, but the point is that there is not that much that can go into cache. Sooner or later, we are going to fill it up. So what happens then? Well, let's say that the user then needs yet another. Uh, piece of uh, data, which is outside the cache. And now, if the cache is full and new cache page should be loaded, an old one must be dropped, which costs several hundred cycles and is called cache mess. Okay, so if you need something, you fill out the cache and you need something outside the cache, this is called cache mess. And a lot of profilers will be able to analyze your code after you run it and it will tell you how, how many cache misses you have. And these are always very, very expensive, which means that you want a data outside the cache when cache is full. Um, so these are the type of things that you should try to avoid or have minimized them. Okay. Um, so how do you, how can you do that? Well, as you can see, the important point is that you're using your reuse, you have to reuse your data that you currently have in cache. That's the basic idea. That's all. So how do you do that? Well, typically you have to allocate an array which is continuous. So um, in Fortran, every array is continuous by default. In C, we also need to make sure that when we allocate uh, multidimensional arrays, we need to allocate them in a continuous way, not making uh, gaps in between, okay? So therefore, uh, when you have dynamical management of, of data, uh, you always, always need, we, what we always do is we don't just append to, uh, to an array, okay? So in, in Python, we have, we have two different concepts. One is called list, in which you can append things. And one is called numpy array. Numpy array is something that is always continuous, okay? And that always is much more efficient. However, um, lists are something that you can append. Whenever you can append something, that means that it's not necessarily continuous in memory. And that definitely needs to be slow because it's not, it's not, um, in, uh, compiler doesn't guarantee you that the data is stored in this continuous way. So if you want speed, then you better have something continuous, which means that either NumPy array in Python or uh, multidimensional arrays in Fortran, or you need to uh, in C++, you also need to find a library which has the so-called continuous arrays. But what you also need to remember is that you need to loop through the array in proper way. So it turns out that uh, C and Fortran are different in this way. Namely, C has so more so-called row major uh, storage that goes like that. So like that. Um, and Fortran has so-called column major storage that goes like that, okay? And you have to be aware of that because you have to loop through an array in different way. So the way to remember this, so the way I remember this is that if, you, if you're using C, then the uh, rightmost index is always the fastest index. So this is the innermost loop for the fastest index and it has to be the rightmost index. Well, in Fortran, it has to be the leftmost index is the one which is the fastest, okay? So if you, if you use this uh, rule, uh, you will always go through the array in continuous way. Now, what about Python? Do, does, do, uh, do you know uh, whether Python is column major or uh, row major? NumPy arrays, what are they? I guess it's same for C or C++, right? Okay, 
That's a good guess. Um, yes and no, in the sense that if you don't specify anything, then indeed is a C-like, which is uh, which is this uh, row major. Okay. If you don't specify anything, by default it's row major. But uh, Python does allow you to specify uh, so-called order. So we can write order equal to F, and that would that would say that order is Fortran-like. By by default, is order is C, which means C-like. So basically, Python does support this order as well. You have to specify it in during the initialization of the array, but um, then you can have the Fortran array. And the reason for this is because if you want to use uh, Fortran in combination with Python, you rather use Fortran arrays. And if you use C++ in combination with Python, you rather use C arrays, okay? Because otherwise your speed might be substantially degraded because of the way you loop through the array. So that's something that you have to be aware of when you code. Yeah, so, but the point is that um, Python has a capability for both. Okay, and finally, just one single word. Yeah, that's the last part in this presentation. So simple word about multi-node parallelization, MPI. So that's the concept that we are not going to discuss much, but if you need parallelization between nodes, uh, you will need to use something like MPI. There are other concepts as well, but MPI is the most uh, common. MPI stands for message, message passing interface. So the way it works is that you have several cores. So we discuss now how to parallelize within such a core. And now we have several of those. And then you have something backbone here uh, which is called interconnect between different nodes uh, that um, uh, allows communication between the nodes. And uh, this tend to be uh, something which is called InfiniBand or just gigabit internet, slightly faster ethernet. So the same, basically the same cable as the one that you have in your house, maybe if you don't have wireless, some of you maybe still have the cable. So the cable is ethernet cable and you have slightly big, slightly faster switch. It's probably already gigabit. So in other words, these cores don't have much better than that. There is something more expensive, InfiniBand, but may, maybe it's only a factor of 10 faster than gigabit Ethernet. Now, in terms of latency, you see that latency of InfiniBand is five microseconds and latency of gigabit Ethernet is 60 microseconds. So these are still several orders of magnitude slower than accessing the RAM. So RAM, we said that it's what, uh, 20 nanoseconds or something like that. And here we're talking about microseconds. So this is really slow, okay? So in other words, sending a message between cores is very expensive. So that if your code is such that um, can do a lot within one core, uh, then, then it could be parallelized well because you need relatively small amount of data to be, uh, to be transferred between cores. Now we also understand now why OpenMP is so important because in OpenMP, we can use the same RAM and uh, we can use so-called shared model programming, the same RAM, which has latency of 20 nanoseconds. That's not so bad compared to five microseconds or 60 microseconds. So maybe our cluster, local cluster has 60 microseconds latency uh, in um, uh, MPI uh, compared to 20 nanoseconds. That's a huge difference, isn't it? So if you can, you should use OpenMP within the same uh, core and MPI between cores. So no, that's the best, uh, the best programming model and it's called so-called uh, hybrid programming model. So OpenMP within core, within uh, uh, within a node, um, uh, with, uh, within different with, between different cores, and uh, MPI between nodes. Okay, so this is um, with this we concluded uh, the first presentation of intro uh, part one. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions? No, too obvious, huh? So uh, 
second part, it's part two here. Uh, we're going to discuss now uh, error in um, floating point operations. So um, let me switch gears and we're going to discuss uh, Randolph error. And uh, basically, uh, as a homework, we're going to implement a basal calculations of basal functions just to emphasize how quickly the floating point error can uh, make our calculation useless. You probably seen this concept before, but still it's not a bad idea to, uh, to repeat a little bit uh, how, the, how to deal with finite precision. So, um, uh, well, more slow, we already mentioned that eight, uh, in 18 months, uh, every 18 months doubles um, uh, amount of uh, transistors. So in 15 years, this increases for, one, for 10 to the power three, uh, which basically we jump from megabytes to gigabytes or gigabytes to terabytes or terabytes to petabytes and so on and so forth. Um, so most computers nowadays are 64 bit, which means that the pointer is a 64 bit. Uh, now, why is this the case? Because, uh, because with 32 bit system, one can address only two to the power 32 um, uh, um, uh, memory uh, slots uh, why? Because 32 bits means the pointer can access 2 to the power 32 only, which is roughly uh, 4 to the power of 9 different locations in memory, which is roughly 2 gigabytes of memory. So if your memory is more than 2, giga, two gigabytes, you cannot access it with 32-bit system. So we need 64-bit system. Now, 64-bit, however, has 2 to the power 64 um, uh, 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 Six, 2 to the power 64 slots, which means that we can access uh, 10 to the power of 19 locations, it means exabytes. So this is not gonna happen for quite many years. So we are safe with 64 bit system for uh, at least our generation, probably our kids generation. Uh, now, but what are the type of, uh, uh, the type of, uh, what types do we have in computer? In addition to pointers that we just discussed, pointer, is 64 on basically all uh, modern computers. In addition to this, we have other fixed point types and floating point types. Now, um, this, uh, how big are different types? Of course, slightly depends on the computer. Uh, if you um, execute um, in C++, you can easily, um, write certain, uh, use certain uh, templates, for example, numeric limits digits or uh, numeric limits minimum, numeric limits maximum, and you can get uh, information about different types. And that's what I've prepared here just to demonstrate what types do we have. So let me go through this and explain what different types uh, typically exist. I mean, all programming languages have this have these types, but the, their name can be slightly different. So in this, the names here are associated with C++. So in C++, we have character, which is an integer type, and it has eight bits, which means that you can have um, 265, which is two to the power of eight, 265 numbers. And character, for example, goes from minus 128 to 127, um, if you have unsigned character, it can go from zero to 256. Now, next in size is integer, which is 32 bits. And it goes from this large number to this large number, which basically it's two to the power 32 numbers. Now we also, we also have a concept of long, which is two to the power 64. And it can go from minus this large number to minus this large number. And then there is long, long, which or at least on my computer is still the same as long. So two to the power of 64. Now the flow, the, the operations with those integer types, of course, is exact. So we never make any error, except when you get an overflow or underflow. Then of course, there is, there is a huge error, but hopefully that shouldn't happen. Now with floating point um, um, numbers, it's a different story. Floating point numbers are never exact, of course, but they have various limitations. One is how big is the exponent? 
So in float, in uh, there are two types in C. One is called float, and one is called double. A float has a is a type where the exponent can be at most 10 to the power of plus 38 or 10 to the minus 38, but not bigger than that. If it's bigger than that, then it uh, it gives you uh, unknown answer. And double has 10 to the power of 300. So this is kind of uh, easier to handle then, doesn't it? Uh, now the size of double is eight bytes while uh, the size of float is four bytes. So eight double is twice as big as float. Now, these are the minimum and the maximum number. However, the issue is not so much the minimum and the maximum number, but it's this thing, which is called precision. Now, what does it mean precision? Do you know what, what, what would this number be? 2 10 to the power 16 for double or for float 10 to the power, 10 to the power of minus seven. So the precision is defined in the following way. If you add this number, which is precision, to a unity, and you subtract the same number, then this, this is the error that occurs. So in other words, let's say that I have unity and I add epsilon. If that one plus epsilon is equal to epsilon, means that epsilon is smaller than my precision, okay? So I can do the following test of errors. I can add one plus epsilon minus epsilon. And the question is, is the result epsilon or is some unknown number like zero? And well, if, the, if this epsilon is 0.1, then of course you expect that we are gonna get the same uh, number out. But if we take number 10 to the minus 16 and we add it to unity and then subtract from unity the same one, you get zero, okay? So in other words, if we add 10 to the minus 16 to unity, then we still have unity. It's not more than unity. Why? Because epsilon is below our precision. It's smaller than num. Uh, is, is is smaller than what we can get to. Uh, that we can uh, that, that the smallest number we can add to unity. So now it's now it's one plus epsilon minus one becomes zero. Okay. So that's the problem with this precision. So if we if we add ten to the minus fifteen to unity we still have, uh, we have 10% error, okay? But if we add 10 to the minus 16, we have basically 100% error. So you can't handle uh, numbers which uh, worry in, in difference for 16 orders of magnitude if you have double. And that's actually a quite substantial problem. Um, now, um, we are gonna discuss this issue of error accumulation in the case of, uh, Basel function evaluations. Uh, why? Because it turns out that uh, naively you would say, well, if you have 16 orders of mag magnitude precision, well, 10 to the minus 16, yeah, precision, uh, you can still do a lot before you you run into uh, numerical problems or numerical error. But as you will see, rec recursion relations typically um, uh, typically. Um, run into trouble within just few few operations. Okay, you can make five, 10 operations and you're already in complete trouble. You have no precision left. Um, so why? Well, because these uh, recursive relations tend to be unstable. But the, the trick that we're gonna learn here is that typical recursion operations can make, one, one can make them stable but slightly changing the algorithm. So, if they are stable in unstable in one direction, they might be stable in the opposite direction. It's so called Miller algorithm to uh, iterate from the other end. And then the discuss, we're gonna discuss this in a second. So, but th th this example is gonna be something that will demonstrate how important it is to be aware of the numerical error. So calculation spherical, spherical basal functions with so-called upward and downward recursion. So as you probably know, the spherical basal functions are a solution of the Schrodinger equation. So therefore they're very important in physics as a concept. Um, they also appear in classical, uh, uh, classical electrodynamics uh, on a sphere. So the solution of the sphere in, in, um, in electrostatics, you will get basal functions. And so they're, they're, they're all over the place um, in terms of importance in physics. 
and we need to evaluate them very, very often. Uh, they are typically evaluated with this recursion relation. So this is a beautiful recursion relation, uh, uh, linear, linear recursion relation. Why? Because, well, uh, JL plus one depends on JL, JL minus one in linear way. There's no squares or something. Um, and it's homogeneous in the sense that uh, there is no um, a, a constant term here. Okay, so it's homo homogeneous linear relation. Looks quite beautiful. And if you know uh, J0 and you know J1, and they are both analytically known, then you should be able to calculate any JL for any L. Okay, looks completely trivial. So I can, I can calculate G, J2 uh, from knowing J0 and J1, and I can then calculate J3 for knowing J1 and J2 and so on, and I should be able to calculate any L. Okay, so, but the point is that there, that this same recursion relation um, is the solution of two different um, uh, functions. One is so-called Basel function and the other one is Neumann function. So there are two functions that satisfy exactly the same recursion operation. And you see, that's the issue. If you, if several different functions satisfy the same recursion operation, you will in general get some combination of one and the other. And we usually need um, just one of them. I mean, typically we need Basel. Sometimes we need Neumann when you are doing with some something outside the sphere. Uh, but the point is, we want to know whether we are dealing with Basel or, or with Neumann function. Of course, we should be able theoretically we should be able to get either one or the other depending on our initial conditions. So if I start with Basel functions uh, at zero and one, then uh, for larger L, I should be also, I should be on the branch of Basel functions. And if I start with Neumann, I should be on the branch of ba Neumann functions. But because of numerical error, I will very quickly um, get a little bit of Neumann function mixed inside Basel function. And it's very hard to avoid that if you don't know um, how to calculate one and the other. Okay, so the way it works is that um, if L is much bigger than X, then it turns out that Neumann function is larger than Basel and for large L and small x the upward recursion for Basel does not work becomes unstable but it works for Neumann and the other way around okay so uh, for large L and small x we said that um, upward recursion for Basel does not work and so what do we do in this case well there is the there is the idea of Miller algorithm to use recursion in the opposite direction. So basically we start with some very large L, which is much larger than uh, X. And then we do the recursion back downwards rather than upwards. So in other words, instead of st starting with J0 and J1, we start with J of some very large L, and then we recurse down downwards to get to L that we need. That's all there is to it. So in other words, either, either recursion upwards from zero to one to two to three to four doesn't work, then start with some lar very large L and go down. Now, how do we start with large L? If we, let's say that you need basal functions uh, of order 10. So then this algorithm says, well, start at 20, but I don't know the basal function at 20 either. So what do I do? Any idea? Are you all asleep? Who is not sleeping? You're not sleeping. You're not sleeping either, okay. But uh, what's the idea? So we need basal function, let's say at order 10, and this algorithm says, well, start at 20 or 30 and go down, but I don't know the basal function at 30 either. Okay, so the algorithm is simple. Uh, we can make a very, very large error at, at, at uh, very, very large L. We can make a very large error if you want to. And sooner or later, error is gonna, it's gonna disappear. That's the idea. So we, we can assign um, that J30, uh, for example, is zero and J29 um, is one 
And that's a huge error because of course, not, no JL is exactly zero, but let's say it's quite small. So we're gonna set it to zero. So some large L will set to zero. Next one, I'm gonna set finite. And it doesn't, that doesn't matter what we set it, some number, let's say one. And then we recurse downwards. Then we get to the L that we need. And then we recurse all the way down to zero. And once we get down to zero, then we can, we can renormalize the entire series. Why? Because the series is uh, linear. Because the series is linear, it turns out we can multiply the entire series with the arbitrary constant. Okay, you understand that? So because the series is linear, you see I can multiply here with an arbitrary constant, all terms at the same time. And if they're, if they're all factor of two too big or factor of 10 or factor of thousand too big, that's okay. So in other words, I don't need to know the precise value of Basel function at very large L. All I need to know is that eventually, what is the value of J zero? When I come down to zero, I can renormalize the entire array for all else. Okay, that's the basic idea. So we're gonna implement this recursion next time. Clearly we're out of, out of time. So we're gonna write the upward recursion. We're gonna write then, we're gonna see that there is a large error and then we're gonna do the downward recursion. And uh, we're gonna check how the error, um, in one case, there is a huge error when you go for some numbers, then huge error for some other um, values of X. And then eventually when you combine the upward and downward recursion properly, you see that you always have small error. And that's the algorithm with which you can calculate any basal function you want. So the, the idea is that uh, with proper algorithm, you can, get, uh, you can get high precision, but you have to be aware of this uh, large, fast accumulation of error. Okay, so no homework today. Uh, you have several things to do for the past. I mean, uh, right now it's not essential yet to give me, uh, to send me uh, your homework, although you can, of course. Uh, but soon I will give you a uh, homework which is going to be unique and you're going to need to actually do some real coding. Yeah, uh, actually, I have question on homework. So, okay. so if, if, if we send the first homework, I mean, the homework you mentioned last week to you, is there any like bonus? Or if we don't send, is there any penalty? Um, I'm not going to give you any penalty. Uh, okay, good. If you get a plus, um, uh, maybe, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So if there is a plus, I will still do that. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. There, yeah. Is, there is a plus, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Question I have a question for round off error. Yes. So for double number, the lower bound actually is much smaller than the round off error. Is that correct? Uh the lower bound, just a second. Uh we're discussing oh. we're discussing these numbers, uh double number, so minimum, yeah. maximum number and error. Yeah. So the error is much, much larger than like the 2.22 times to the negative 300 something. Yeah, so sure. Mm -hmm. will this cause a problem? Like for every number we compute, like smaller than the round of number we cannot trust? Like uh, well, that, well, that's, that, that's the, 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 the basic reason that we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna discussing this uh, uh, basal functions is because we need to make sure that uh, we are calculating our results within certain precision, like, uh, I don't know, precision 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven, that's what we usually want, isn't it? But if every operation, each operation that you do, each summation on each, uh, each multiplication can be precise only up to 10 to the minus 16, okay? Basically, you cannot trust anything more in each basic operation, more than the 16 digits. And then when you do, I don't know, 10 operations, then if your error accumulates very, very quickly, you might have only six, um, uh, six uh, precision, I don't know, six digit precision. And then within 16 operations, you might have no precision whatsoever left. And that's what happens in basal functions. And it can go, can go very quickly. 
But of course, we, therefore, we need to avoid the so-called unstable operations. If you, uh -huh. if, if your operate, if every operation is stable, then the error will decrease with the number of operations. So when you, so th I see. When you calculate basal function in the right direction, you will see that the error actually decreases with the number of operations rather than increases. It's interesting. So I see. the hope is that you should never lose the precision with, the, with a good algorithm. So the runoff, it only happens when we have operations. Yeah, yeah. every operation, yeah. every multiplication, every summation has this precision. That's it. You can't have better than that, 10 to the minus 16. But then the question is whether you make 10 operations, is the error still 10 to the minus 16? Or is the error 10 times, uh, is the error, I don't know, a few orders of magnitude worse? You shouldn't have it for orders of magnitude worse because then you don't know what, what really happens. Isn't it? So you have to be aware of the, of the error and you have to try to control the error. That's the important point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Uh, well, another question about the homework. So, so, so last homework, I, it's basically repeat what what we have done uh, on the class, right? Yes, yes. So, so what is required for submitting their homework? We just uh, compile the code, run the code, and make yeah. a snapshot. For example. Okay. That would be more, okay. Yeah. So you see, it's not a big deal to do it. Just demonstrate. Okay. Okay. And you get the plus. Yeah. So do we need to send like some? executable file to you or not? No, 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 okay, no. So uh, just executable, I don't even can ex execute, so it's useless. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any proof that you've done, I mean, uh, screenshot, uh, the timing. Okay. Uh, timing. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. Anything. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you for coming. I don't want to trick because, you know, the, I, I cannot really check. Yeah, <laughs> okay, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other? Question? There was something in chat. Uh -huh, okay. Professor, what is the NX in the Basel questions? Uh, what is NX? Let me check. Let me check what we were discussing. NX. Uh, NX. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, uh, oh, this thing here. Yeah. This is Neumann. Neumann. Uh, you remember in uh, in uh, Basel functions there are uh, there are two two um, types of Basel functions, uh, spherical Basel and spherical Neumann. So the, the difference is that the spherical Basel is the one that goes to zero. Uh, no, sorry. It's, it's small at small x. So Basel zero is one at small x and Basel one is zero, Basel two is zero, but Neumann is diverging at small x. It's a different uh, solution of the same recursive uh, uh, iteration and it's actually the same solution of is different solution of the same differential equation so in in basic math uh, we go through the differential equation like this and we say well this differential equation is second order differential equation so it has to have two independent solutions one is Basel the second one is Neumann Isn't that, there are two possible solutions there are two solutions because it's the second order differential equation it has to have two solutions and one is Neumann one is Basel the same with recursive relation because recursive relation again it's a second order so it means that it has to have two solutions so that means if we iterate this uh kind of uh, questions then the the basal the glx will be similar as the nlx if we do it increasing the numbers no, the, the, it's not the same. Actually, it's very important that uh, the Basel and Neumann are very, very different functions. So when one is diverging, the other one is, is finite and the, other, the, the opposite. So they are very, very different functions. The problem is that when you, when you just iterate such an, such an algorithm, uh, such a recursive relation, uh, you are not guaranteed to follow Basel or Neumann function, but both or any, okay? because this recursion is valid for both. So if you start with exactly with Basel function and you have an infinite precision, you're, you are mathematically guaranteed to stay on the, on, on, the, on the Basel function or follow the Basel function. If you start with a Neumann and you have an infinite precision, you should be able to stay on the path of Neumann function when you iterate this, okay? Now, however, because you have a finite precision, sooner or later you make error 
and then you're going to go slightly away from the basal function. And if you go in the direction of unstable calculations, you will start mixing in a little bit of Neumann and sooner or later you will end up in Neumann function completely. That's the problem. However, if you go into a stable way, you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to go into, into your preferred solution, even if you start it wrong in a wrong way. Okay. So mathematically with infinite precision, once you know what is the starting point, you should be, you should always follow that particular solution, but because of numerical error, that of course doesn't happen. Uh, if you follow the recursion in unstable way for basal function, you will sooner or later end up in Neumann function. But if you go in a stable way, then even if you start with Neumann function, you will, you will, you will go, you will get into basal function anyway. That's the idea. Okay, got it. But in order to do that, of course, you need to know which direction is stable. Okay, and for each L, L and each X, uh, the iteration is stable. That's all there is to it. Okay. okay. Any other question? How to spell the Norman? Uh, you just said the Norman function. How to spell the Norman? That's Neumann, the Neumann, Neumann, Neumann. I think it's Neumann. I think it has two N. N, N E U M A N N. Let me Google this. So, whether it is stable or not is proven in mass. Sorry? So, whether it is, is it the method is stable or not is uh, proven in mass? Yes, yeah. Um, mathematically, basically, it's very simple. Um, uh, basically, the stability is it, it changes from one to another when L is equal to X. So if L is bigger than X, one is stable. And when L is smaller than X, the other one is stable. And that you, it's very easy to see why. Because it turns out that, um, that when L is exactly X, then um, for example, this term, the first term and the second term are almost of the same, uh, the same size. I mean, they, they subtract almost exactly. And when they subtract almost exactly, then of course, whatever you calculate on the left-hand side will become very imprecise. But then just, uh, just, get, just putting this JL minus one on the other side and JL plus one on that side, which means that you're now iterating on the opposite direction will of course completely change that. Then basically you're gonna sum two numbers which are, which are of the same size rather than subtract them. And, uh, and of course then all of a sudden the operation is gonna be infinitely stable, very, very stable. So nice. we, we will see this, it's very simple. So the, the, the basic, basic issue is, let's say that this number here, this number, and that number are almost exactly the same and you subtract them. Let's say that they are equal with, with, with precision 10 to the minus 16, they're equal and you subtract them, then what you get is anything, doesn't it? You're supposed to get some very small number, but you cannot calculate what the small number is because it's basically within the error. Um, but if you, if this was plus, for example, okay, then then it's easy because then you are summing two numbers of the same the same size and then the error does not occur. Yeah. Got it. So it's just like convert a subtraction to a sum. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need to make sure that you are not subtracting numbers which are almost the same size. If you subtract the numbers that are very, very similar, you're going to get in trouble very quickly. Okay, any other issue? Any other question? <laughs>